is Dr. Jay Marion. Um, his background is in hematology oncology and a sort of sub sub specialty in palliative care. He's our medical school, he's the associate dean for academic affairs in the medical school. He's also, I would say, the guru of how to have a, a, a complex or difficult conversation at many levels. And uh, he has presented a lot of this uh, materi material at a big national meeting, the American College of Physicians, uh, recently. And so I think it's a really useful thing for us to have. We talk to patients, patients' families, each other, who knows what, uh, and have sometimes difficult conversations. So, so this is a great uh, uh, little bit of help for us uh, as surgeons to, uh, to maybe make those, uh, and to those things that happen smoother. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, this is kind of going to be difficult conversations 101 where we're going to define kind of what the structure of a difficult conversation is and how to recognize that you're in one before it's too late. Um, there are lots of other talks that if this is useful to you that I can come where we dig in deeper with specific problems. But I thought we'd talk about dealing with difficult conversations. Initially, my impression was we would talk about conversations with patients, but I realized that many of our difficult conversations are with each other, and that's why I added in colleagues. And so most of my examples will be difficult patients, but there's going to be some in there where it's a difficult colleague. So our job is to navigate the turbulence. You've all been in conflict, and it, it's something you don't want to do, and it usually goes bad if you don't get control of it. So we're going to hope in our goals and objectives to recognize and deal with conflict as it unfolds. That's when you have to recognize it as it's unfolding. You have to understand the structure of the conflict just the same way as surgeons. You have to understand the anatomy of complex organ systems. If you go in blind, you're going to make a mess of things. Most of the time, conflict, I'm going to show you there are three different conversations that are going on at the same time, and you have to be able to dissect them apart. And you need to learn the skills for attempting to create alignment when opinions differ instead of always winning. Now, difficult patients is something all of us deal with, and it's said that one out of six outpatient <coughs> visits is considered difficult. They're time, con time consuming. Professionally, they're oftentimes unsatisfying. These are patients who sometimes come in with five or more somatic complaints. They have personality or mental disorders. Wouldn't it be nice if we only took care of patients who had great coping skills, but we don't. We have patients or families who have unrealistic expectations. I want to be cured. I don't want to hear what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. And we now are in a day of direct-to-consumer testing advertisements where patients will come in and say, I want to see a, you know, 125, and I want a CEA, and I want this, and I want that, because somebody in my family had some kind of cancer. Um, perpetual conflict is associated with compassion fatigue and ultimately burnout. I don't like the term burnout because it applies to too many things. I think what physicians actually feel is compassion fatigue. You just get... I like to use the expression exhaustipated. You all know what exhaustipated is? You're too tired to give a shit. And, and that's what happens to many, many uh, physicians. You just get so tired, I just don't care anymore. So the problem with difficult patients is, we all know this, 90% of your time might be spent with 10% of your patients. And how do we handle that conflict? Well, most of us follow this. And it's not very effective. It might put you in an early coma, which resolves the conflict for you, but not the conflict. And as I had mentioned, sometimes we have conflict with our colleagues. And how we live out that conflict, in front, specifically in front of our medical students, is hidden curriculum. The medical students are always taught be kind, be compassionate, be empathic, you know, recognize things from other points of view, don't be critical. And yet, sometimes they'll see um, physicians who are bullies. We yell at each other in front of other people. You know, there's, there are times where if, if, if somebody's about to do something wrong, you might have to raise your voice and say, no, don't do that. But to lecture them and tell them how worthless they are in front of their colleagues may not be something we always want to do. But 
probably everybody in this room has seen some physician somewhere yell at a nurse, yell at a resident, yell at a colleague, yell at the ER. These are things that we have to recognize. And this was just in the New York Times last month um, when the bully is a doctor. And I would urge any of you who wanted to contact me, and I'll send you the article. It's about a doctor talking about his experience growing up in the medical profession and how he witnessed just doctors tearing each other apart. And the reason that's important is, as you, many of you know, we have an epidemic of physician-associated um, physician suicides, uh, physician leaving, physicians leaving practice early saying, I've had enough of this. So we, we need to learn to talk to each other in a better way. <clears throat> so first, we need to recognize that we're in conflict before it's too late. Most of us don't realize we're in conflict until we've raised our voice. But you, you should be able to be looking for circular conversations. You say something, the patient says something back. You just say the same thing again louder. They say the same thing louder. And you're not getting anywhere. Your body language, when you start getting like this um, and you're leaning back, what is that body language telling you? I'm trying to create a distance between you and me. You and I are not on the same page versus kind of leaning into the patient and, and letting them know you're there with them. Um, being sarcastic, um, being critical of the person you're discussing with. You also should be aware of your own feelings of unease. You're feeling threatened. You're feeling angry. You, most of you know when that's happening. You just have to have your antenna up and be looking for it. And once you've noticed, I think I'm in conflict. I think this is about to get worse. You need to step back and consider the options. Now, if you try to avoid the conflict all the time, you're going to feel taken advantage of. You'll ruminate over your hurt feelings. And um, sooner or later, those feelings are going to come to a bubble. And they usually erupt at an inopportune time. However, if you're continuously confronting conflict, you might make things worse. You don't always win, <clears throat> and you suffer the consequences. If I go to battle with someone over an issue and I lose, um, I may have consequences to bear. So all of us kind of think in this binary code, I either avoid conflict or I confront conflict. But I'm going to try to show you that there are lots of ways to handle conflict. Um, this is the Thomas Kilman conflict model, where we go from, you know, I want you to know a lot of people think you're either uncooperative or you're cooperative. You're born that way. You're either unassertive or you're assertive. You're born that way. And that's not true. This is something where it's kind of like in that uh, Kenny Rogers song, you need to know when to hold them, no one to fold them. You need to know when you can shift on the Likert scale from being uncooperative to cooperative, from being unassertive to assertive, to get your goal. And these are the various goals. So competing is when you try to satisfy your own concerns at the expense of others. So if you're always uncooperative, you don't want to see my point of view, and you always are going to assert your point of view, some people would say you're kind of like the bully. This guy's always got to win. This guy never can lose. On the other hand, exact opposite, you can be very assertive but cooperative and try to find a win-win solution that satisfies both parties. And we call that collaboration. Kind of in the middle is compromise. You, you might not make everybody happy, but you might be able to make everybody happy enough. Say, OK, I got it enough. Um, it's not exactly what I wanted, but I can deal with it. And we'll show you when you might want to compromise in, in the next slide. Um, avoiding is you're kind of being uncooperative and Unassertive, I'm just walking away. You start griping at me about something, and I go, then I walk away. I'm just not going to deal with it. Is that ever appropriate? Yes, it is. We'll find out there are times when you want to do that. And then accommodating is if you're very cooperative and unassertive, then you carry the world on your shoulders. You're always giving in to somebody else's needs, and you never take care of your own needs, and ultimately you feel used. So you try to satisfy the other person's concerns at your own expense. But there is a time and place for each of these. And that's why you need to know how to hold them and fold them. You need to know where on each of those lines you want to be. So when do you want to be 
competitive, when you want to compete. I'd say when you're dealing with an emergency and tough decisions must be made, I'd say you as surgeons probably deal with that much more than I do. Somebody's got to make a decision right now, and sometimes there's not a lot of time to debate what's the best way to clip this aneurysm. You might have to just go in. And so then the senior most person may have to dial up the assertive scale and be uncooperative and say, no, we're doing it this way. So sometimes if you're dealing with an emergency and tough decisions need to be made, you can't have a committee make that decision. Sometimes somebody has to step up. Collaboration is when it's not such an emergency. Time's available. Do I do a lumpectomy or a mastectomy in this woman who's already had lots of radiation to her breast? Um, there are lots of people involved. Maybe I should get the radiation oncologist involved, the medical oncologist. Let's, let's collaborate. Let's see if we can find something that works well for everybody. Compromising is when you need a quick solution, not maybe an urgent. You need a quick solution, and a short-term solution is okay. So I know we're not going to resolve our problems right now, but can we both live with the fact that we'll, we'll come back and decide on it tomorrow? Or for right now, let's do this, and then we can revisit tomorrow. That's, you're, you're kind of bending, but not completely giving in. And it, you're, you're saying uh, this is going to be a short-term solution. Avoidance, like I said, it is appropriate to avoid. If I've got a lot of things on my plate, and my wife calls me and wants to tell me that I left my socks on the floor in the bathroom, Right now, I don't have time for that. So I might say, OK, sorry, and hang up. I'm, I'm avoiding that. Con you know, I, I don't have time to have the debate about, you know, well, oh, gee, I'm at work all day. And, you know, I, I, it's just not worth it. So you let go of that. And then the accommodating is when you're wanting to be generous. Sometimes I will give in. It's not important to me, whether we have vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream. But I'm not going to tell you it's not important to me. I'd say, I like chocolate, but if you want vanilla, that's fine. I'll eat it because now I've got a favor in the bank. <laughs> when I want some, when I want something, I can come to you and say, "Remember that time I wanted chocolate, but we ate vanilla," and that's when a quick solution. So, so I guess the point is, I want you all to recognize that it's under your control where you dial up where you want to be in a given conflict once you've recognized it. So you need to decode conflict. Like I said, once you get into the weeds. Um, uh, in, the, uh, in the surgery in the pelvic floor, I know it's very complicated. If you got me in there, I'd look and I'd say, I don't know where to start. I'd get lost in the detail. I, I just wouldn't even, I'd be, become paralyzed. Same thing with conflict. Conflict has an anatomy to it, and there are basically three structures. And your job to quick, is to quickly identify the what happened conversation, the feelings conversation and the identity conversation. And I'll show you how those all get entangled, but your job is to disentangle them because then you can recognize what's going wrong and, and find a solution. So each difficult conversation is really three conversations playing out at the same time. You can't disentangle the what happened from you hurt my feelings to who, who the hell do you think you are anyway. Those conversations all kind of come into one. So the general structure of conflict is generally the what happened conversation, the feelings conversation, and the identity conversation. And I would make sure you see this reference by Stone, Patton, and Heen on difficult conversations because it, it outlines this in much more detail than I can go into right now. In each of these three areas, we often make predictable errors, cognitive errors. We, I'm going to show you the errors that you're likely to make so you can be on the lookout for them that will distort the conversation and actually escalate the, the conflict. So the kind of first conversation is the what happened conversation. And that's who said what. We might have disagreements about what happened or what's going to happen. If we, if we follow your way, this is going to happen. If we do it her way, that's going to happen. And it's very cognitively focused. Um, those are fueled by errors of assumptions. There's a truth assumption, not recognizing that the same facts can be associated with different interpretations. Uh, Kellyanne Conway became famous for saying alternative facts. I think we 
those of us who don't like her are gonna still say that, but those of us who wanna cut her a break will say what she was talking about was there are alternative ways to interpret facts. I think that's what maybe she was trying to say. And that is true. There are lots of facts out there, but we might interpret them differently, and we have to be aware of that. There are other stories, and there are different points of view. Okay? Stormtroopers look friendly if they wear their helmets upside down. Do you believe me? <laughs> okay? So it's a point of view. <laughs> I want to do a little experiment. Everybody put your hand up in the air. And I want you to look up at your finger and start tracing clockwise. Go clockwise. Okay? You got a good rhythm going clockwise? Now gradually bring your hand down. Now it's at eye level. You're still going clockwise, right? Now go down below your chin and look down at your hand. Which direction are you going? Now you're going kind of. So can you see if you're real tall and I'm doing this? I'm saying I'm going clockwise and, and you're real tall and you're saying, no, you're not. You're going kind of clockwise. We could actually get into a, a fight over a, interpretation because we have different points of view. So you need to remember that, that there are always different points of view, and you're only seeing your point of view. Your job is to try to see the other person's point of view as well. And I like this. This is pretty clear. <clears throat> so we tend to think that our view is more common than it really is, and I assume that if you're a rational person, you should end up agreeing with me, right? If you buy this assumption, the solution is always simple. Oh, my job is just to convince you so that you'll say, oh, I see now. Now you've shown me the light. Say it again. Say it more clearly. Say it louder. And if they don't get it, it must be their fault. And that's what we do. You can watch these conflicts occurring. The amplitude of the conversations going up. People are repeating things. They're kind of being a little insulting, saying it, really, do you understand what I'm kind of insultingly? So as we said, the same facts can be interpreted differently. So here's two facts. Mom is dying and mom is not eating. Those are the facts. Everybody agrees. Mom is not doing well. She's dying. She's got one foot in the grave, one on a banana peel, and she's not eating. Now. The family may say mom is dying because she stopped eating, so they want a, a feeding tube placed. And you're trying to convince them that mom's not eating because she's dying. If mom is dying because she stopped eating, you need, you need to put in that feeding tube and force feed her. But if she stopped eating because she's dying, a feeding tube will cause complications without reversing the dying process. How many of you have had conflict with family members regarding something like this? Very common. You're thinking, this isn't going to help, but the family's saying, you need to do this. So how do you handle this is the truth assumption? You believe your truth is right, they believe their truth is right. Since the same facts can be interpreted differently, when you run against the truth assumption, be curious. So say to the patient, you want this, or the family, you want to show them that you're interested, you're lying, you haven't come to the table with your mind already made up, so you, you want to express to them your curiosity, so could you share with me why you think mom stopped eating? Because then that gets them thinking, if I just say mom's not eating because she's dying, they're not going to hear that. But if I say, can you tell me why mom stopped eating? Tell me what, what, what do you think's going on? Um, offer information as an alternative rather than the truth. Instead of saying, no, she stopped eating because she's dying. She doesn't need the nutrition. She's dying. She's got a going out of business sale. She's not buying new inventory. That kind of stuff doesn't help. <coughs> offer alternative information. Say, you know, you raise an important concern. May I share with you my thoughts? OK? And recognize that you can't always resolve the chicken and the egg question by interrupting with yeah, but statements. And that's what we tend to do. The family goes, well, mom's got it. How's she going to get strong? Yeah, but. But mom's got it. Yeah, but. And we just can't resolve who came first, the chicken or the egg, by saying yeah, but. 
you kind of have to say, you know, share more of your thinking with me. So that's the biggest source of conflict in the what happened conversation is not really agreeing on what the truth is. And then there's the intent assumption, confusing impact for intent. They're both six letter words and they both start with I, but they cause lots of trouble. I might call my wife and say, honey, I'm, it's, six, it's quarter to six, it takes me 15 minutes to go home. I'm leaving now, I should be home at six. I walk out the door and Dr. Chu stops me and says, Jay, can I ask you a question? I got a patient with a carcinoid I want to discuss with you. So we get talking for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, I walk in the door, I'm 20 minutes late, and my wife says, I thought you were going to be home at six o'clock. Damn it, Carol, you know I'm a doctor and you know I've got responsibilities. I, Dr. Chu stopped and asked me about it and she's going like, whoa, 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 where did this come from? I was just worried because I knew you had trouble with your car. I was afraid you were in an accident. So I, my, the impact on me was I felt challenged. But her intent was she was just worried about me. But we all do that. Have you all been in a situation with a significant other where the significant other says, I thought you were going to call me? last night. And instead of saying, oh, I was unable to, you jumped down that person and said, well, you know, I'm busy. I'm a medical student and I got called. To and it's like, whoa. Now you're all laughing because it's true. <laughs> You've all done it. So always remember that the impact on you does not always reflect the intent of the person. And then there's the blame assumption, and that's not recognizing your own contribution to the conflict. And you have to always step back and say, you know, I, I'm sure I've got something to do with this. Now let's go to the, that was the what happened conversation. You've got to be cognizant of that. That's going to always be in some conflict. But then there's also the feelings conversation. And the emotions become conflict fueling. Uh, the Beatles said all you need is love. The Rolling Stones said you can't always get what you want. So the Beatles are talking about love, but there's all these other emotions that the Rolling Stones tried to tell us about. Now, most of us don't like feelings conversations. And I've heard doctors say, you know, Marion is too touchy-feely. He gets into these touchy-feely things. We need solid information. Well, why do people avoid feelings conversations? Well, they'll say, well, feelings can cause harm and can interfere with rational thought. I need to be objective at all times. Even though I've just told somebody they're dying, I have to be objective. I can't acknowledge their emotion. I can't fix feelings, so why talk about them? You know, how you feel is how you feel. Why should I even get there? And feelings may overwhelm me, and I don't want my feelings to show. I, I, I've had Doctors and students and nurses say, I, I, I was tearing up in that room. I needed to leave that room. I, I'm not supposed to show emotions. Well, Mr. Spock says it's logical. It is not logical to let feelings cloud important discussions. And I think that's why most of us try to avoid the feelings conversation. But if he understood amygdala hijacking, and amyg amygdala hijacking was a term brought up by Daniel Goldman, a psychologist who wrote a book uh, um, on the emotional intelligence, why it matters more than IQ. And he talks about that the emotional brain, the primitive limbic system, gets to the cortex before your cognitive brain, your thinking brain. And that's great for fight or flight. I need to either get the hell out of here or not. I don't have time to think through my options. And the problem is, your mom knew that, because I'll bet you everybody in this room, I don't care what culture you came from, had a mother who somewhere along the line said, if you're getting angry, count to 10 before you say something. Have you all heard something like that? It was because we know that if you let your uh, amygdala hijack your brain, you will say something that you can't take back. Um, you get in a fight with your significant other, and you go, you know, when you get like this, you're just like your mother. Oops, oops, there ain't no taking that back. Because tomorrow when you're talking to your significant other and that person says, what did you mean by that? Oh, I was just angry. Yeah, I know you were angry, but why did you say that? 
What do you mean I'm just like my mother? So that was the person who got amygdala hijacked and not count to 10. And so I think if Spock understood amygdala hijacking, he would recognize that Kirk does have emotions and he will start yelling. So maybe it's not logical to ignore emotions. Um, since feelings are at the heart and soul of difficult conversations, you're going to feel them and the person you're talking to is going to feel them. So instead of saying, you know, we have to ignore them, I would say that ignoring them is more harmful because of amygdala hijacking. Sooner or later, the emotion's going to come forward, and you don't want it to come forward in a way that's uncontrolled, where you've said something. Once I accuse my, the person I'm having conflict with of being an idiot, or, you know, what, what the hell were you thinking, you dumbass? Once I've said something like that, it's over. There's no coming back to the table to, to reason. So I need to be address the person's feelings and my feelings to dial down the emotions so that neither of us get hijacked. I can't fix feelings, so why talk about them? Well, that's where empathic communication. I don't have to agree with your emotion. Um, so I, I'll see a woman who, when we met her, she had high-risk breast cancer, and we told her that with adjuvant chemotherapy, her chance of relapse is going to go from 50% to 20%. But we say there's still a chance she'll relapse. She goes through her adjuvant therapy. A year later, she relapses, and she says, you promised me if I took that treatment, this won't happen. Now, she's emotional, right? Is it going to help if I give her a cognitive answer and say, no, remember I said it was going to reduce your risk from 50% to 20%. Unfortunately, you're in that 20%. It's not going to help. It's not going to help. I have to acknowledge her emotion, and that's empathic communication. Just let her know you get it. Say, I get it. It must make you very angry. It makes me angry that the treatment didn't work the way we wanted it to. We, I'm staying aligned. We wanted a better outcome. You must be angry. That's acknowledging the emotion. You don't have to run from it. That's just an empathic response. You name and understand and respect the emotion. And be mindful of your own feelings. Because you can't control the wave, as every surfer knows, at best you can anticipate it and attempt to ride it successfully. You have to know you're getting into area of conflict, so you put your antenna up and you're a little bit more mindful. Because if not, this could be a patient or a colleague, and something gets said, and their amygdala explodes. So now they yell at you. You told me this treatment was going to cure me. And now I feel, no, I did not. And so now my amygdala, because I'm a human, my amygdala explodes. And this is not conducive for problem solving, is it? you got two people yelling at each other. And let's go now to the identity conversation. How do you see yourself, and how do you see the other person? Could these views affect actions taken or perceived? Now, for our third-year medical students, if rounds are going to start at 9 o'clock and you're already up working on some notes, you wanted to get some things written, and it's 5 to 9, 7 to 9, something like that, and one of your colleagues walks in, how many of you would feel at least a little comfortable saying, hey, rounds isn't going to start for seven minutes. Dr. Marion isn't even here yet. Could you run down and give me a donut? Probably no problem. How many of you feel the same way if Dr. Marion walked in at 7 to 9 to say, hey, Dr. Marion, could you run down and give me a donut? You probably won't do that. And, and technically, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to, but you, you know that there are certain roles. We say, what, full professors get 10 minutes to be late. And, you know, you, you've heard all of those things, that, that there are different roles we assign to people. So it might be OK to ask my colleague to do something for me, but I might not ask Dr. Eggersted to do it for me. Um, even though she might be more than willing to do it, it's just I won't do it. Now, where does this come into to, to effect with our patients? How you see yourself and how you see your patient will set up the roles that you construct. And what are the roles? There was a time it was always paternalism where it was always doctor-patient. I'm the boss. You're the bossy. You'll do what I say. Um, there are patients, older patients, still like that. My mom, she's gone now, but before she died, if some doctor would have walked in and said, Lorraine, let's talk about your options. We could do it this way or that. She'd freak. She'd say, no, you're the doctor. Why are you talking to me? Just tell me what you want to do, because she grew up in a culture. 
where the doctor made the decision. She didn't want to hear all of this. But as you know, we're not in that world much anymore. Most of our patients are considered themselves partners in healthcare. They're partners with us. And they'll say, you know your medicine, but I know my body. I want to be a partner with you. And some are looking at you as just a consultant. I know what I want to do. I just want to hear your arguments. Now, <clears throat> if you assign the roles, I decide it's doctor-patient, and you really want me to be your partner or a consultant, it's not going to go well because we've misinterpreted the identity. So you've got to kind of quickly figure out, how does this patient want you to, to interact with them? <clears throat> then we talk about you versus I statements. You statements begin with the pronoun you and imply that the listener is responsible for something. Jane, why are you getting so upset with me? You know, why are you being like this? Okay, what have I just done? By using the you statement, I've accused her of something. I'm the judge and jury. Why are you being like, you know, why are you so bored with my lecture? I can tell you're bored. What's the matter with you? Okay, that breeds further conflict. Compare that to I statements. Such statements, the you statements demonstrate no ownership of the emotion. I feel like you're bored, but I'm not going to own it. I'm going to accuse you of being bored. And so this might be with your colleague. You're really, you just got a bunch of sicker patients and you're writing your notes and you see your colleague looking at his cell phone and you're pretty sure he's doing e personal emails or looking at the news or CNN or something like that. And you say, you're just sitting there playing with your phone and not helping me. That's a you statement. It's not going to get what you want. I am not just saying, I'm looking up a patient's records, blah, blah, blah. Instead of the I statement where it requires us to take responsibility for our interpretation of the feelings of others. So I can be assertive without sounding hostile. So to that same colleague of mine, I might say, hey, I'm really feeling overwhelmed. I'd appreciate some help with these admissions. Could you help me? That person's more likely to put down their phone and say, yeah, what, do you, what, what can I help you with? But if I start off by saying, you're just sitting there playing with your phone and I'm getting backed up and rounds are going to start in 20 minutes, you, know, you, could, you could help me. They're not, it's not going to work. So instead you say, hey, I'm getting overwhelmed. I could you really use some help. You think you could. Okay, that person is more like, so, so keep in mind, if you're starting, if you're getting in conflict, be mindful, try not to use the you word. Try to use the, I sense you're getting upset with me. I sense you're bored. Because that gives you the right to correct yourself. You might say, no, Dr. Mirren, I'm not bored. I was just actually thinking about that point you made. I thought that was a good point. So it gives you a chance to respond, but you're not gonna respond if I've already accused you. So, when you're starting to get into conflict, you have to ask yourself, why is this getting to me? Okay, be mindful that there are those three conversations and they're all going on at once. Am I acting as if I already know what I need to know? Am I making assumptions about the other person's intentions? Is the other person responsible for my feelings? Is I'm dealing with the what happened, the feelings, and the identity conversation. I'm trying to quickly decipher those and then say, which of my buttons are being pu pushed? Because we all have buttons, we, you know that. There are certain things if I want to tick you off, I know what button to push if I know you well enough. So a common ripe for conflict scenario in the wards that I'll bet you, you all see. Uh, Mrs. J is a 75-year-old woman who's admitted to the hospital with abdominal pain. During the course of her workup, she had a CT scan of the abdomen that revealed metastatic pancreatic carcinoma. The patient has a daughter who's adamant that no one should tell her mother that she has cancer. The family meets you at the door. We do not want mama to know she has cancer. Now the conflict is your opinion that the patient has the right to know information. You understand principalism and the four principles of medical ethics. You know the, the whole basis for informed consent and medical decision making is respect for autonomy. The patient has the right to know what they're up against. But you're up against the family member's opinion of what they believe is best for their mother. They don't care about your ethics. They care about what's best for their mother. 
How many of you have been in a situation like this where some family member has said, we don't want mama to know? We all have. And how do we handle that? Well, most of us say, well, I've got to either pick autonomy and say, well, I'm sorry, but you know, I have to tell her. Or we say, okay, and we kind of waffle it and whitewash the discussion with mama. That's not the way to do it. So what you want to know is why might she not want her mother to be told? Why is this otherwise well-meaning person? This person obviously loves her mother. She does not want him to hurt her mother. Why is she reacting in this way that is challenging you? Because again, you know the intent. You know the impact, but maybe not the intent. So the impact of her challenge is she's questioning your authority as a physician. But do you really know her intent? Is she just wanting to be difficult? Is that why she's there, to be difficult? And how do you explore her reasons? Be curious, remember, we talked about that. So tell me, what do I need to know about your mom? Before I go in and talk to her, what, what do I need to know about her? Well, mom's going to be all, she, her brother died of cancer a few years ago, and she's, she always kept saying, I'm scared, I'm going to get it. So she's going to, mom's scared. She's scared that it might be cancer. Help me understand why it's so important that your mom not know about her cancer. Share that with me. Why is it really important to you that mom not know? That's showing respect for the person. That dials down their amygdala. What are you afraid might happen if she knows? And can we think through what will happen next if we tell her and if we don't tell her? Let's be analytic. Now, this is a pearl. Words matter. Um, these are pearls I use pretty much every day. I try to avoid why questions. I much prefer what and how. Why don't you want your mother to know? What If I were to say that, why don't you want your mother to know? I might get a sharp response. Because I'm her daughter and I know it's best for her. That hasn't advanced the conversation. Look at this. Compare with what do you hope will happen if your mother is not told? Now I've kind of put the burden on that family member. Okay, It might be easy to just say we're not going to tell mama, but what's going to happen if we don't tell her? That makes some think and come to the bargaining table. How will we be able to treat her if she doesn't know what we're treating? If we have to give her chemotherapy that makes her hair fall out, how are we going to do that if she doesn't know what we're up against? That gets some thinking. So. Whenever I find myself in conflict with somebody, instead of saying, why do you feel that way, it's what do you think is going to happen if we do it your way, do it my way? And how are we going to navigate this if we do it your way, if we do it my way? Also, we want to stay aligned. I don't want to give somebody two negative options. She's already told us, the daughter's told us, this is going to be just destructive to mom if we tell her. Now, if I do this, if I use the but clause, instead of the end clause, I'm giving her another option that she doesn't like. So this is the but clause. I can see you want the best for your mother, but not telling her what is going on may leave her more frightened of the side effects. So now I'm saying, you got to pick. you got to tell mom something that you think is going to hurt her, or you got to let her be frightened of the side effects. How many people want to choose between two negatives? None of us. I want to get you on my side, I want to give you something that's positive, something you can go to. And that's where the end state comes in. Versus, I can see you want the best for your mother, and telling her what's going on will leave her less frightened of the side effects of treatment. See how I crafted my words? Instead of saying, not to, but not telling her is going to leave her frightened, I said, and telling her will leave her less frightened. I've now given them something where they they can see maybe one of these has a little bit of green in it, where the other choice, the but statement, everything's in red. Try to give them an option that they can bite into. And so that usually comes with and statements. Don't try to convince the family that they're wrong. You're not going to. They know their mo mother better than you do. Don't, don't ask them what they want to do, because they've already told you what they want to do. And don't forget to address all three layers of the conversation. This is where your brain's got to be working in overtime, separating, oh boy, this is a what happened, what will happen conversation. This is 
um, an emotional conversation. Maybe one of the kids has guilt, hasn't paid attention. Maybe mom's been saying, I have stomach pain for a long time. And the kids goes, oh, it's just indigestion. Now that same kid finds out mom has pancreatic cancer, that kid might have guilt. There may be a lot of emotions at play. If you feel that you've got to win every time, you're going to create resentment. How many of you know people, and it doesn't have to be in, med in the medical profession, people you went to school with, grade school, high school, parents, aunts, uncles, neighbors. You're going to meet people that if they get in conflict, they always have to be right. And even when you show them that they're not right, they will still dig in. We all know people like that, and they're not fun to be around. So how do you diffuse conflicts? Once you've noticed the conflict, your, that's your internal step. I need to notice it. So I, we talked about that. I might notice the circular reasoning, the body language, the eye rolling, slide, sideway glances. You can ignore the conflict, but you're going to risk the fact that it reemerges and that it may reemerge, erupt with more emotion and be harder to tamp down. So that's probably not something you want to do. So how do I, once I recognize that we're in conflict, so Dr. Chu and I are debating a patient, and I can sense we're getting in conflict about it. So instead of saying, you know, hands on hips or like this, if I said, hey, Glenn, can we talk about what's going on here? That's letting him know that I recognize we're in conflict, and it's, you know, can we talk about what's going on here? Obviously, we're seeing that this different. Can we talk about it? Instead of starting off with, why are you being this way? You know, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you about the last three patients I saw on patient after patient after patient. This, and then he tells me about four patients, patient after patient after patient after patient. And now we get into that kind of match. It's better just to acknowledge, can we talk about what's going on here? And you can do that with family. When the patient's getting angry at you, you promised this was going to cure. Can we talk about what's going on here? Be mindful. You need to pause before rushing to judgment. You need to create space for the other person. Don't box them in. Creating space. Some of the medical students have heard me do this, but you can still participate. But for those who don't, I want you, I, I want to hear your voices if you've not heard this. As fast as you can, spell the word poke. As fast as you can, spell the word joke. What do you call the white of an egg as fast as you can? Yolk? Is the white of the egg the yolk? Okay. What, what I did is I tricked you into not being mindful, not to create space. Because you heard joke, you heard poking. So the next thing you heard the word was egg, and you assumed I asked about the yolk. Mindfulness means when you're getting into conflict, you create space. Let that person, you box that person in. They will say that which comes to their mind first. I need to create space for them to think, and that's called mindfulness. So you need to create the space for the other person. Don't box them in. Don't hit them with a barrage of questions. Give them time to think. So I might say to that person, can you share your thoughts about this with me? That's giving them time to think. Be mindful of the moment. Don't start mentally preparing your rebuttal while the other person's talking. So I might be having a debate with Dr. Eggerstad, and she's trying to make her point of why she thinks doing it A is better than doing it B. But instead of me listening to her argument, I'm preparing my rebuttal of why B is better, and then I didn't even hear a thing she said. So again, you're not, you have to create space for your patient to be mindful, or your colleague to be mindful, and you also have to create space for yourself to be mindful by paying attention. So identify what the conflict is about and articulate it as a shared interest. This is the alignment. Hey, we're both interested in getting what's best for this patient. Can I share with you my take on this? I, I, I've heard what you said, but I, can I share with you my take? It's just a kind way of saying maybe there's another way to look at it. Brainstorm options. Could we list? the available options and spend a few minutes discussing the pros and cons of each. Now I got some ideas. Can we can we just sit down and talk about it? Look for the options that recognize the interests of all involved. We want to try to collaborate. 
So I want us to find an option that we can all be comfortable with. Just start off with that instead of, no, we've got to do it my way. Just, you know, I, I, I can see we're not, we, we both want the best for our patient, but we're seeing a different way to do it. Um, can we find something that we can both agree on? Perhaps we can consider trying your way or my way, and we can always reevaluate and change course if we aren't satisfied with the result. That's giving yourself and the other person permission to be wrong, where you don't box them in, you don't box yourself in. Can we try, I would like to not give IV vancomycin and zosin right now because it may just be a viral. Can we just, the patient's not hypotensive, can we just increase the frequency of the vital signs instead of coming in with the nephrotoxic big gun antibiotics? Can we just kind of maybe wait for the cultures and just we'll get vital signs every couple hours and the, I promise first hint that the blood pressure drops, we'll come in with the big guns. Um, that way, if the patient gets better and defervesces, you got a solution that helped your patient. If the patient does get a little sicker, the temperature goes up, blood pressure goes down a little bit, you start your antibiotics, no harm is done. And you've stayed in, in um, collegiality with your colleague. And remember that some conflicts cannot be resolved. We're talking about diffusing conflict, not eradicating it. You will always have some conflict. Not all conflict can be resolved in a way that everyone likes, but you should be able to do it, have your conflict in a way that doesn't make the other person feel they've been personally attacked. Sometimes you just need to agree that you don't agree. And what do you do then? If it's two residents or a student and a student, they say, well, that's why God invented the attending. We're going to go ask, you know, Dr. Chu how he wants to do this. I've told you how I feel we should handle this. And instead of starting to yell at each other, just give it to somebody else. Just agree, say, we don't agree. I think we need to get a neutral party involved here. And I like this. Aristotle said basically, you know, criticism and conflict, the criticism is the root of a lot of conflict. And he said there's only one way to avoid criticism or conflict, and that's to do nothing say nothing and be nothing. And I don't think any of us want to do that. So we want to be able to do something. We want to be able to say something. And we want to be able to be something, but not in an abrasive, hostile manner that just fuels conflict and gets the patient where they say, you know, you're a jerk. Give me my chart. I'm going to go see a doctor who knows what the hell they're doing. That doesn't help. Or to have conflict with a colleague that you're going to have to work with for the next you know, several years, um, and it's just not fun anymore. So our goal is to get from here. And those of you who have been into my office know that I'm a big Beatles fan. I've already referenced them once. I like John Lennon. I want to get from there to here, where we say there are no problems, only solutions. Your job is to try to find the solution first way to do it is, like I said, be mindful of the components of conflict. Be dissecting it just the same way when you get into a surgical field, you're saying where, where are the veins, where are the arteries, where are the nerves, where, get the layout. What is my what happened conversation, what is my emotion conversation, what is my identity conversation, and be able to, because to, they're going to come at you not in that order. You just have to be able to feel it and say, oh, this was a what happened statement, this was an emotional statement, this was an identity statement, and I've given you some at least tools to approach those. Um, any questions? <laughs> Thank you for letting me share with you. Any questions? Yeah. Jay, I just have a comment. Sure. You know, as you were giving this lecture, I was just thinking about my teenage daughter and how I could use this uh, in our difficult conversation. So it's I, very applicable to daily life. I was telling Jane, I think just yesterday the day before, how much I've learned from my daughters. My first daughter, I thought I, I always thought myself pretty good with conflict and conversations, difficult conversations. I remember the first time when she was a teenager, she came home 
crying because her boyfriend dumped her for a girlfriend, for one of her girlfriends. And being the protective father, I said, well, Amy, we never liked him. He was a jerk. <laughs> you know, there's lots of other fish in the sea. And by the time you find the right person, you won't even remember this person's name. And what did she do? She cried louder, ran into her room, slammed the door, and refused to talk to me. That didn't work. That was not an empathic response. I gradually got smarter by the time it was my last daughter, and she came home and said, you just broke up with me, he wants to go out with another girl. I just looked at her and go, it really hurts, doesn't it, when you love somebody more than they love you? And she just fell into my arms, started crying on my shoulder, and just stayed with me. Because I acknowledged, that was an empathic response. I acknowledged her emotion, I validated it, I said it hurts when you love somebody more than they love you, it doesn't it? And so yes, you, I, I think you and I should write a book about what we've learned from daughters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can't talk about sons, I didn't have any, so my only experience is raising daughters, and I've learned a ton. A lot of this stuff didn't ring true until, and actually when I do the breaking bad news, the spikes protocol, you know, what is your perception, and, you know, may I share with you? Actually, my daughters kind of learned pretty quickly um, to say, Dad, I'm not one of your patients. I know where you're going with this. So, so they kind of would bust me. But most of our patients don't know that. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you again.